Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight to talk about how you as yard owners can prevent and manage infectious diseases on your yards. My name's Katie and I head up the marketing team here at SEIB. Hopefully you'll all be aware of who SEIB are, but in brief, we're equestrian insurance brokers who insure everything from horses to horse boxes to livery yards. Some of you may even be insured with us yourselves. At SEIB, it's important for us to provide as much useful content for the equestrian community as possible. And leading on from Strangles Awareness Week last week, this is why we're hosting tonight's webinar. Tonight, we've got a panel of three experts who can each give you a unique perspective on equine infectious diseases. First up, we've got Cheryl Johns, who is the founder of Livery List, Livery List and the Yard Owner Hub. We've got Jonathan Cleaver, who is the co-owner of Ivesley Equestrian, a livery yard in County Durham, who experienced a Strangles outbreak last year. And finally, we've got Dr. Nicholas De Brewer, Head of Welfare and Behaviour at Red Wings Horse Sanctuary. So let's dive into the webinar. I'm going to hand over to Cheryl now. Thanks, Katie. So I'm Cheryl. Um, many of you will probably know me. For those that don't, I run Livery List and the Yard Owner Hub, offering support and guidance to yard owners in all aspects of practical and administrative yard management over the last 12 years. I also work as a consultant for various equestrian charities and associations, advising on all aspects of yard management, helping them understand the needs of yard owners and helping horse owners understand what makes a good yard. Running a livery yard, as many of you will know, is pretty much completely unregulated. And I'm a huge advocate of best practice for yards, helping develop this, um, covering the health and welfare of equines and client management are obviously a huge part of this. As a yard owner, there's a duty of care to protect the equines on your yard in line with welfare legislation and in conjunction with the horse owners. One part of this is for the yard owner and the horse owner to take the necessary steps, not only to try to prevent infectious diseases such as strangles, but also to act promptly in the event of an outbreak or even just a suspected case. This is not only to react to the needs of the equines, but also the needs of the yard, the livery clients and the horse owners as well. An outbreak of infectious disease can result in a costly and complicated situation for all involved, which can have a devastating effect on the business, the clients and the horses on the yard. Sometimes, despite the best efforts and intentions, an outbreak can take hold of a yard and it's important to understand how to plan and manage in such a situation. Tonight, I'll be chatting with Jonathan Cleaver of BHS approved Ives the Equestrian in County Durham, which is a busy livery yard competition and training venue, and we'll be discussing his experience of their Strangles outbreak last year. As you may know, it was Strangles Awareness Week last week, and some may have already seen or heard Jonathan because he was involved in some of the content for, uh, for Strangles Awareness Week. Tonight, we'll be discussing in more detail the effect that the outbreak had on him as a yard owner and in terms of managing his business and clients during that time. We also have Nick on hand to give us some information on how yard owners can best prevent, plan and adapt when it comes to infectious disease. So before we get chatting, I'll just do a bit of housekeeping. Um, this is being recorded, so the recording will also be available if anybody wants to rewatch or isn't able to stay and watch the whole thing live. Um, Katie will be sending a link out to that tomorrow. But if you want to have a pen and paper handy to take down any notes, then obviously feel free. Uh, we should have the time for a short question and answer session at the end. If you have, an, have a question you'd like to ask, if you put this in the chat function, um, and then at the end, we will go through and pull out some selected questions um, and, and a point this to the appropriate person. Um, we possibly won't get around to all of them. So any that we don't get around to, um, we can forward on to SCIB or Red Wings or myself as necessary to come back to people. So that's enough of me talking. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan now, who's going to give himself a little introduction and tell you a bit about him and Ivesley. Um, and then we'll get into the chat about his experiences. So it's over to you, Jonathan. Um, <clears throat> hello, uh, I'm Jonathan Cleaver. Um, my my family and I run Ivesley Equestrian Centre in County Durham. Uh, we've run Ivesley for 11 years, although it's been open for a lot longer than that. It's been an equestrian centre for about 40 years. Um, it used to be a BE venue, and um, people remind us daily that it used to be a BE, a BE venue and look quite disappointed that, that it no longer is. Um, but we, 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 we do run a lot of um, unaffiliated competitions, um, one day events, hunter trials, clinics, show jumping, etc, etc. Um, we've got 55 horses on livery here, um, a mixture of DIY parts and full livery. Um, 
Over and above Ivesley, I've, I've actually got a day job. Um, so I'm a director of engineering at a global software company. Um, I'm, 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 I'm pretty practical and like solving problems. I have lots of crises uh, to deal with in my day job. So uh, the Stranglers outbreak here pales into insignificance compared to um, uh, having 100,000 users trying to use a system that's not working, uh, uh, shouting at you all day. So I, I have to deal with this all day long. Um, and uh, so I, I brought some of those skills to this. Um, so I'd like to emphasize that while I'm not horsey, um, I do strongly empathize with animal welfare and the distress caused to them. Um, however, I do feel that this is pretty well covered and I want to talk about the effect on the yard and the business and the people um, to help um, yard owners, you guys, understand this impact. Um, and a spoiler alert, it's um, it's not pretty. Um, I've chosen to speak out on strangles because um, it was a pretty horrendous time for us as a family. Uh, and I wanted some good to come out of it. Um, and uh, at the time and on reflection, a lot of it seems avoidable and unnecessary. Um, I was struck by um, the amount of disinformation available, um, how much there is online, how much there is that circulates amongst the various yard experts we all have on our yards. I'm sure you recognise the, uh, the character and the amount of hearsay and superstition that goes around. And uh, what I would also say is that this isn't entirely altruistic. Uh, we didn't invent strangles here. It came from somewhere else. So by educating others, it also helps us to avoid it happening in the future. Great. So obviously, as you say, um, Jonathan, with Strangles Awareness Week last week, Strangles in general has been covered in quite a lot of detail and, and definitely the awareness of biosecurity is increasing, I've noticed, over the last few years with the help of various um, campaigns and such like that highlight highlighting the problems, particularly through yard owners and the situation on livery yards. So did you already have a biosecurity protocol in place for liveries at Ivesley? Um, either for new arrivals or for people going out to shows and competitions prior to having the outbreak? Uh, yeah, we did. Um, so new deliveries were isolated for 10 days and they needed a negative strangles blood test before they arrived. Um, we'd all, always insist that vets email those results to us directly uh, because we were conscious of um, people potentially doctoring documents. Um, and over and above that, we, um, well, this all sounds quite basic, but uh, when we first moved in, we had, we had problems with uh, people doing things like swapping horses, swapping stables, sharing tack, that kind of stuff. So we, 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 we stamped all that out. Um, as we tightened procedures at every step, we did feel a bit like liveries resented having their freedoms curbed. Um, so, but we, we felt it was important to raise standards on the yard um, uh, in general. Um, we didn't allow any visitors or competitors into delivery stables. Um, uh, we uh, have in, a, in our terms and conditions uh, for competitions and all over the the, um, the social media posts we put up about our competitions, we always say, you know, don't touch up horses on the yard, don't come on the stable, uh, like, like come on the yard, don't, uh, don't, don't come in the, uh, uh, into, the, um, into the stables. Um, we also had a, uh, a stock of um, foot baths, antiseptics, and we'd done uh, a, a, some risk assessments on, on, on what happened if a, a disease came onto the yard. So we, we, we already had a lot of the, the kit here ready to go. Um, what we didn't have was a policy around our liveries traveling to events. Um, and we also didn't take temperatures uh, when horses were in isolation before strangles. OK, that's all obviously a lot more than a lot of yards have. Um, I know that there's it's a there's a huge variant basically in biosecurity procedures yard to yard. Um, but obviously, even if you try the hardest and have protocols in place like you did, it's not necessarily going to stop an outbreak because it can worm its way through into the yard somehow. Um, how was it that you first found out about the outbreak on your yard? Um, so there's. There's me personally, and there's us as a yard, uh, which are, are, are two different things. So it was towards the end of June last year. You probably remember it was a really hot and dusty spring and early summer last year. And um, a livery's horse had a had a snotty nose. And the assumption was that it was some sort of allergic reaction to the dust or to or to, uh, or to all the pollen. It was really very dusty. Um, 
so the livery concerns was self-treating with antihistamines and didn't mention anything to our yard team uh, but eventually our yard manager got wind of it and she arranged a swab test of the discharge from the horse's nose um, w without the owner um, consenting actually she 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 felt it was important to, to just do it and um uh, she arranged the the swab test and that that swab test came back the next day positive for strangles um so that's how the yard found out about it um and then uh, the owner got the results and our yard manager um, spoke to the owner and the yard manager spoke to to my wife um and my wife called me about 10 minutes later so end to end of that chain of communication was probably 15 20 minutes um but um i was at work in my day job um uh, up in newcastle and uh, and i already knew we had strangles um and i knew it had strangles because i'd had a message from someone on facebook asking for a refund for our competition that weekend uh, on account of our unfortunate case of strangles uh, and what has happened was the livery had gone straight onto Facebook and put it on Facebook. And then that message just ran around the local area. And uh, uh, so, 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 so I found, I found out circuitously that way. Um, it's a, it was a real lesson to us really very early on um, how fast news spreads, particularly, particularly bad news. Um, I was going to talk about this later, but I started talking, I'll talk about it now. The, so, to underline the point of how fast news spreads, the the post we put on Facebook about about us having strangles was seen by uh, by seventy thousand people. Um, we've only got eight thousand followers. Um, the post where we announced our all clear was only seen by three thousand. Um, so that, that tells you how fast bad news will spread versus good news. Yes, so social media is a wonderful thing sometimes. <laughs> um, so knowing that you already had the biosecurity procedures in place beforehand, obviously, to try and prevent infectious disease and outbreaks on the yard. Um, when you found out collectively yourself and the yard that you had an outbreak or you at least had a case on the yard, um, did you know what your next steps would be? What were your first thoughts when you when you knew that that was factual that you had a horse that was positive for strangles on the yard um so i had a conversation as a team about about what to do uh the family and and our yard manager and pretty early on we knew that we we well we we knew that it was really serious and we knew we had a lot of work in front of us uh but, but what we had to do was to figure out um what the what the current situation is where you know where do we stand today and then um make a plan from there about how to deal with it um so very early on we got the vets involved um and also our yard manager went straight out with um a bottle of alcohol gel um some lubricant and a um a uh, a, a thermometer to go and um uh, take the temperature of all the horses straight away um and that was actually one of the best things that we did um because she found one horse with a high temperature and isolated it straight away um, and that that horse subsequently developed symptoms and was confirmed as having strangles later on um so we we credit that kind of initial running out with the with the lube and the, the thermometer as uh, as really containing it because we figured out straight away where we were at um one of the problems with an outbreak, it's it's not so much the horses that you know have strangles, it's the horses that you don't know have strangles. Um, so that uh, that really helped us. Um, and then we knew we had to, to make a plan um, with the team. Obviously, our staff were a bit shell-shocked, so we, we need to make a plan with them. Um, the, the affected horse owners and the vet, and then communicate that to our liveries. Uh, we also knew that we had to cancel our one day event the following weekend uh, and we had to communicate that to the public. Um, we'd already had experience of how quickly this all spreads online, so we knew that we had to make a plan around the messaging uh, before it got away from us. Um, Nature uh, and Facebook famously abhors a vacuum and we were worried that rumours would start, so we want, wanted, to get ahead, uh, wanted to get ahead of it and control the narrative for ourselves. Uh, we decided early on that we wanted to use a single vet. 
uh, to make coordination simpler and to avoid any mixed messages. Um, we've we we found out that um, there are a lot of disagreements even in the vet world about how to manage and treat strangles, and we wanted to avoid that and give a um, a unified message. Um, and using a single vet and therefore a single lab also gave us a lot of buying power. So we were able to get um, a really good deal on guttural pouch washes, which helped to cushion the financial blow to our liveries and helped overcome some of the uh, of the resistance that they might have from a financial basis. Um, it meant that coordination was a lot simpler as well, um, rather than trying to coordinate multiple vets from multiple practices um, who may or may not be prioritising it particularly. Having a single vet involved, they they knew that they were on point, and that they and, and that they need that they needed to 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 help us out. Um, I'll say that the that only one of our liveries decided to not use um, that that one vet, and I'd say on balance she regretted it because uh, she paid a lot more, and it was, it was a lot a lot of hassle for her to arrange the vet to come at the same time. Yeah, I can imagine it's uh, how how many horses have you got on the yard? Fifty five. Fifty five. Yeah. So it's it's a large expanse of uh, equines to to work with. Um, so is your BHS approved yard at any point? Did you um, get into contact with the BHS about if they had any support or guidance on on the outbreak or how you could help manage it? Um, you, you know, we didn't, um, but that that that's not a slight on the BHS. It's more the fact that we 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 already had a contact and an in at Red Wings, and we knew that they that, that they had a wealth of experience on this stuff. So, um, the the bat phone was connected to Red Wings rather than the BHS. But uh, that's that's not to be taken as we don't trust them. It's just uh, we knew the other guys better. So when when the outbreak was confirmed um and you knew that you had a positive case and other potential cases as well what how did you find that the liveries reacted um to the situation did you find that they were kind of working with you or against you or that they supported the decisions what was the sort of overall reaction i suppose from the from the owners um so obviously everyone was really concerned and worried about what it meant for them and for their horses and they were pretty upset to be losing uh, potentially the summer because uh, they, they all had plans and hopes and dreams that were in tatters. Um, by way of them working with us, um, by and large they did. Um, uh, I, I had to stand in front of 40 extremely anxious ladies and gentlemen uh, who were worried about their summers and tell them that we were going to be operating a um, a dictatorship for the next few weeks uh, because we we needed them to do exactly what they were told for the next few weeks and and, and to be fair they 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 did it um, but we we made a point of taking control early on we made a point of getting the information that we needed to make a plan um, getting that plan and getting the information across to, liv to the liveries so they they knew why we were doing what we were doing um, and that that really helps um, we're very conscious that in this day and age, uh, you know, the, the the encyclopedia of Google um, and then things like confirmation bias, where you can look for stuff until you find the answer that you want, um, and then that becomes fact. Um, so we, we we knew we're in we are in that age, and we were we we're really conscious about making sure we 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 were all working um, with the same information as our liveries, and um, we didn't really need to twist anyone's arms. Um, they all did what they needed to do, and they all they all worked together really, really well, and together with our team and us. Um, so the plan that we made um, and that we communicated to all the liveries was that we were going to isolate their horses in their respective herds um, out in their fields. We didn't allow the herds to mix, didn't allow people to mix uh, uh, between herds either, and the horses' temperatures were to be taken daily and communicated with the team via WhatsApp. Um, we 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 tried to get yeah you know, uh, we we tried to get liveries to manage their own horses on their own as best they could. So because we were conscious that our our staff could themselves become vectors, even if they're being super careful with their biosecurity, they could still become vectors and and, and spread the infection between horses. Um, 
and then after three weeks, um, uh, three weeks after the symptoms are cleared from all the horses in a given field, we would then virtual pouch wash them to confirm that they were clear. Um, we chose the virtual pouch wash over the blood test because the blood test was proven to be unreliable. Um, horses, it, patient zero that brought strangles here came with a negative blood test. Um, so we had our confidence knocked in that a bit. And we, um, so has the camera broken up? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, okay, um, so we, we, we used the virtual pouch wash as being our measure that a horse is clear. Um, and the plan worked pretty well for us uh, because it was summer and the horses are kept in herds. Um, a different time and a different arrangement would have meant we would have needed need a different plan. Um, once you got the plan together, we organised a yard meeting and we ran through it with the vet and answered any questions. And most people were pretty anxious, um, but they accepted that we were where we were and that we need to work together to resolve it. Um, they, are, they asked sensible questions. They listened to the answers. Um, interestingly, we had a couple of people who had a lot of anxiety after COVID um, and they actually found themselves unable to come here. Um, so they they needed support and they needed um, to have their horses taken care of by our staff. Um, with the horses staying in fields, uh, we had some issues where some horses got quite fat, um, some got quite hard to catch. Uh, there were concerns for laminitics and also shoeing became a bit of an issue. Um, and liveries you know, kept kept saying that they wanted to bring their horses in or they wanted special treatment. But we figured out that if we gave one person special treatment, the whole yard would want special treatment, and then we'd have a problem, and and we'd, we'd be back at um, back at square one. So we're pretty um, rigid on the management of it, and and I don't think everyone liked that. Um, I'm not sure everyone would want to be told what to do with their horse, especially if it's something that they didn't want to do themselves. Um, so strangles was so i know i'm rambling a bit but i didn't do this um strangles was first identified on the 27th of june um the the, the vast majority of horses about 90 percent got clear results after five weeks and they could they could start being ridden again they could start using the facilities and doing all the things they wanted to do um the last horse uh, argento who was in one of the one of the videos didn't get clear until the 21st of october but because we were managing uh, the horses and herds and keeping everyone separate, we knew that we could allow the clear horses to do what they needed to do without 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 it causing an issue. Um, interesting bit of a bit of behaviour about the liveries was um, after they got their clear results, about one third of our liveries left. Um, so we lost, uh, uh, I think at one point we had 16 people left. Um, I put it down, uh, that down to some people didn't like being told what to do, um, uh, especially by me. Uh, and some also reevaluated their choices after the trauma. It's like if, you, know, you have a trauma, it's just a natural time to take stock and think about what your priorities are. So some people moved horses closer to home. Some people, um, uh, 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 some people mo uh, moved on from horses entirely. Um, and also some people uh, didn't think we'd we'd get it cleared for the rest of the year and they got in, they got impatient and left um as a knock-on from that so i know i'm rambling show uh, as a, a knock-on from that um because because people were leaving before the whole yard was clear we couldn't get people in so new liveries weren't coming to replace them and it meant that not only were we losing income we were also having to return deposits and it it, it put us into a a very difficult position financially. That's that's what I was just going to touch on next. Actually, <clears throat> excuse me. Was that obviously it's not just the liveries that you've got, and you've you're a big yard compared to many with 55 horses. So you've not only got the extra cost, I presume, from um, staffing and people having to be on hand, as well as all the vet costs and all of that. Um, but obviously, because you you run events and you must have people coming in to hire the facilities so that must have had to all stop for the period i presume over the four months at least in the in the um of the actual outbreak 
So I would imagine that the whole thing has actually been quite costly for you over and above perhaps what people would initially just think of, which is, you know, vets, disinfectant, so on and so forth. Absolutely. Um, so the term I'd use was that, we, was that we hemorrhaged cash for about three months. And it was a mixture of having to cancel events. Um, and entries then had to be refunded. Uh, so I had a I had a very unhappy trip to Durham. Um, our our internet broke at the at the, at the farm. It was broken for a week. I had a very unhappy trip to Durham, where I I went to Durham to use the internet in Durham, and uh, came back um, a a five figure sum lighter after refunding all of our competition entries, um, which is a extremely poor hourly rate, I must say. Uh, but yeah, all of our events were cancelled until September, and then subsequent events that did run were were very poorly attended. Uh, and we 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 figured that our our cross country hires could start as soon as we got all the green horses. So, that, so this is like the the kind of ninety or percent of them of the herd clear, because we could keep them isolated. Um, and and the cross country is is on an entirely separate part of the farm. So we we open for cross country schooling, but that really wasn't well attended uh, because IBC has strangles. Why would you go there? We had uh, uh, contact from people who said that they wanted to come, but they were worried about being lynched by their fellow yard mates if they came here to hire the cross country. So they they simply didn't. Um, also, because the one day event was cancelled last minute, there were a lot of costs that we still had to pay. So the medic still needed to be paid uh, and other people still need uh, still needs to be paid. So um, we, we lost well over you know, like well over a grand on that, not including the lost income from refunding everyone. Um, overall, I think conservatively last year we lost between twenty five and thirty percent of our income across the year because uh, we lost the summer's events, we lost a lot of liveries. Um, and this is at the time when we had the the crazy spike in electricity and diesel prices as well last year. Um, and what that meant was we ended up having to put the staff on short hours. Um, it meant we had to raid um, family savings and the kids' college funds, and any non-essential maintenance and expenditure simply didn't get done unless it was dangerous then things got fixed but anything that just looked a bit shabby just got just had to get left yeah so uh so not great um obviously another thing i suppose is you had 16 horses leaving um and then presumably there was a delay in being able to get these stables filled not only because you needed to have the yard tested clear but did you find that there was a reluctance on people to move on to the yard obviously because you'd had an outbreak perhaps even once it was all done and done and dusted and you know um, returned to normal so uh, par uh, partially um i mean the, it it starts on the, on the 27th of june last year and we cleared strangles on the 21st of october that was when argento the other really poorly horse in the videos um finally tested negative um so it was about 16 weeks in total um we didn't fill the livery yard up again to normal levels until March of this year. And I think that the way we handled strangles actually ended up working positively because we did get people who who had who, who, who knew we had had strangles here. And because of the way we handled it and communicated it, they decided to see if there, to see if there were spaces here. Um, because of the timing, and because um, Argento, it's all Argento's fault, because Argento didn't get clear until the 21st of October, um, we missed the autumn period where liveries tend to move around. So we only began to pick up liveries really after Christmas. Um, and the staff were on short hours until late March. So our team, they had reduced income um until late march which was wasn't great for them you know they went through christmas on uh, on short hours and less money um and the ripple effects still continue to be felt now um so without uh, wanting to bore everyone too much with the intricacies of um of vat um you'll 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 probably know that 
there's a split between vat vatable income and non vatable income and we can reclaim a proportion of our of VAT on stuff that we spend money on that depends on the proportion of the vatable versus non vatable income. Um, we lost out on so much vatable income last year that e even just last week, our accountants uh, presented me with an adjustment to our VAT position and another bill for five grand um, because our because we had over claimed VAT back on purchases last year. Um, so I'd say we're, <laughs> we're still getting a kicking now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like the, no the knock-on effect has been awful. Obviously not, but this is a thing that I, that people don't realise with the strangles outbreak is, is it's, it's ever so much sort of a blame game and what have you at the time, but actually the number of people that it can affect is, is ongoing and, and the time frame that it can affect things is ongoing. Um, in terms of uh, obviously you're you're a big a big yard, so you obviously have insurance in place. Um, did you have anything uh, that you were able to claim on the policy? So did you have a business interrupt in insurance or any insurance cover that was able to give you some of your losses back? Well, here's a story. Um, we thought we did. Um, so we've got business interruption insurance and event cancellation insurance, um, but neither of those insurances paid out because infectious disease isn't listed as an insured peril on those policies. Um, so word from the wise, your insurer will tell you what is insured, but they won't tell you what isn't. Um, and uh, a, a check in the policy for infectious disease wasn't frankly top of mind. Um, so we didn't think to ask. We, as a business, we were far more concerned with protection from visible visible harms, you know, things like thefts, flood, fire, and ensuring that we had we had cover for accidents involving employees and the public. Um, so yeah, we, we were the the guy from the insurers was terribly apologetic and really empathised with us, but he wasn't going to pay us any money, not even not a penny. <laughs> oh dear. So. Uh, what now you've been through all of that and you know all you know all of the aspects all of the losses all of the difficulties that you've encountered from start to well still going on with the that aspect um what would your advice be to yard owners thinking about the costs of the costs and hassle of putting biosecurity measures in place versus thinking oh that's fine we'll never have an outbreak on the yard what what would you because I find when I talk to uh, yard owners about biosecurity, there, there's kind of the people that just don't bother because they don't have the information or the knowledge or the want to put that in place. You have the people who, like you, to the best of their ability, are trying to be belt and braces about the whole thing. And then you have people who are sort of a bit in the middle and think perhaps it's a bit of hassle and it might put yard uh, might put livery clients off and it might be a bit costly. Um, how has it left you feeling that all yards should um, should approach biosecurity kind of overall? <clears throat> um, well, apart from the distress and welfare issues for the horses and the emotional drain it will place on you, um, having an outbreak is extremely expensive to the cost of putting some fairly basic biosecurity measures in place. Um, I think looking back, we were a bit naive with our, with our approach before Strangles because we placed um, a, too much emphasis on appeasing and pleasing liveries and, and too little on safety. So we set our isolation period at being 10 days because we thought that two weeks would sound like too much for liveries and, and, and it would put people off. Um, but actually it was those four days that made the difference for us. Um, you know, a horse came here with a negative shangles test. It was in, in isolation for 10 days. And then on the 12th day, we, we realised that there was something amiss. Um, so there's obviously a balance to be struck between allowing people the flexibility to enjoy their horses versus keeping them safe. Um, but I think that on balance, um, when you've got a, a strong biosecurity procedure in place, you actually get the clients that you want um, and you get um, you get a good reputation for doing the right thing. And um, what, what I've noticed um, is that uh, uh, 
um, being uh, being copied is the is the sincerest form of flattery. We found things that we've done being picked up by others. Um, and, and and you know, I'm I'm finding my my wording in other people's Facebook posts now, but which is which, which is quite nice. Um, but it's um it's interesting. You you're only as strong as as, as your weakest link. Um, so I work in IT. My day job is um, huge web systems that cater for millions of people. Um, and in IT, we have to we have to think really carefully about security, and we think about la layering up our security so that if hackers manage to penetrate a system, they have to break through many, many protective layers. And if they succeed, they they can't actually do any harm. We hope. Um, and we need to take the same approach to biosecurity around new liveries, travel, visitors, professionals, and then harden the business to be able to cope if any of those measures fail. Um, so things like vaccinations, having PPE and antiseptics in stock and ready to go um, are, are, are pretty simple steps that you can put in place. Um, but then also the the administration, like making sure your insurance covers you uh, for infectious diseases and also running a business to make sure you've got enough cash reserves to run for three to six months with with s severely reduced or even no income uh, would also help. So stuff like that. So, yeah, the um, the cost of not preparing is um, significantly outweighs uh, the um, uh, 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 other cost of preparing. Yeah, definitely. Um, so have you made any changes to your to your biosecurity policies since the outbreak to try and cover any sort of gaps that might have been in there previously? I know that you said you didn't have any before about people travelling off to events. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, so we've tightened up the biosecurity around your liveries. So rather than go for the blood test, and I I know that Nick has opinions on the way that we use the blood test as part of our procedure and it means that what what i'm about to say is perhaps unfair but we found the the blood test unreliable um even um so so otto who was the worst affected horse was tested several times with a blood test and came back negative every time even though he had raging strangles um so all new liveries now have, have now have to have a guttural pouch wash test instead of a blood test and they're in isolation for 14 days rather than 10 and we've introduced a biosecurity policy around traveling to competitions events and camps um, rather than simply relying on individuals common sense because uh, it turns out that common sense isn't quite so common after all um, and we're we are also now asking new liveries to have the strangles vaccine um, a number of our liveries have, have already had the vaccine, uh, so about a third of the horses here are, are now. Um, we we don't want to tell people what to do. We are if they all if they are already here. But what we've done is we've we've made sure that our biosecurity policy rewards people who have been vaccinated by affording them a bit more flexibility when they travel. Um, and then I guess in terms of lessons, um, lessons learned from this, uh, it's hard to narrow it down to just one. Um, so I have a few lessons I'd like to I'd, I'd like to share. Um, the fact that everyone on this is a, is either attending or watching this webinar means that that I'm probably preaching a converted. But you must take biosecurity seriously. Um, a strangles outbreak is an existential threat to your business and it has a, a profoundly cooling effects on the industry in an area with an outbreak as a whole so competitors can't come here but also our liveries can't compete elsewhere um, and you find that if there's a, an outbreak in, a, in an area other competitions and other venues shut down as a precaution so um, competitions and, and events elsewhere are cancelled suppliers lose out and other other events may may be poorly attended um, a strangles, sorry, a publicised strangles outbreak is, is only the tip of an iceberg in in that region. Um, it came here from somewhere. Um, I know where it came from. They've not said a word, and it this will be repeated all over the country. Um, so it just means that you can't trust any horse. Um, sick horses look healthy. 
healthy horses can be carriers and the owners simply won't know. It's not the owner's fault often, they, they simply won't know. Um, there is a, a ludicrous amount of misinformation, um, out of date information, hysteria and folklore, which borders on superstition around strangles. Um, even some of the vets hold old fashioned views or have differing opinions on what's best. Um, it's because of, I, I believe it's because there's such a broad range of symptoms and timeframes over which those symptoms present themselves. Um, and also exceptions are, are often held up as being typical. Um, the internet allows people with almost any opinion or belief to find people who agree with them and amplify that message. So you have to look to, to, uh, to people who you can trust for information and it's not the lady on the yard who's been there for 40 years and says she knows everything. It's people like Red Wings who talk to scientists all the time. Um, bad news spreads really stupendously fast and if you have a, um, a social media presence you've got to get on top of that straight away. Um, I mentioned the stats earlier um, and the final thing uh, so I did I did say I winged on Cheryl uh, finally um, strangles is a is a people problem it's not a horse problem it's not even a people problem um, people spread it um, people spread mis misinformation about it and people can solve it too with really simple basic common sense precautions here end of the sermon thank you for listening no, it's, it's been great i think it's really good that you've chosen to share your story because obviously there is a lot of information out there from reliable and a lot of unreliable sources so you're kind of giving a first person perspective of very directly and honestly how it's affected you and your business and your life and the people on your yard um like you say i there's definitely been an increase in people in yard owners that have an awareness of biosecurity and horse owners as well um and i agree with you that people should be transparent if they have um biosecurity policies i know on on the listings on livery list there's definitely more yards now that mention on there it, just on their yard details you know strangles tests are required or we've got a biosecurity policy so there's definitely a a shift in the thinking of a lot of yard owners um and i think a lot of that is obviously thanks to to strangles awareness week um and the the content that like yourself uh, and richmond also put into it so um i'm going to have a chat with nick now i'm going to let nick introduce himself and then we're not going to go into sort of in-depth strangles details because that's all been covered many times but i'm just going to chat to nick about more how it affects yard owners and things that yard owners should be considering or or implementing. So I'll let you introduce yourself, Nick, and then I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions. Hi, and thanks. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I was really impressed with how I've Lee and in recent times, you've discovered a few other yards that have followed the, the guidance that's coming through our hub or through the BHS steps program. And in our own situation in 2015, that it really works. And I was kind of exposed to Strangles when I started at Red Wings in my first week in 1991 because they'd had an outbreak and our quarantine was also not fit for purpose even though we had one but horses were coming and going all the time rather than a, as a batch and so one horse came and infected one that was going out and that led to us getting the Animal Health Trust involved so I basically was a vet, the second full-time vet at Red Wings. My colleague had dealt with the worst of the outbreak and actually we were still tidying up horses six months after that outbreak. So strangles and screening for it has always been part of my job at Red Wings. We had at one point 1,600 horses at the sanctuary and um, that was before we had horses going out on loan and we had only a few centres. So it was a vast concentration of horses. So we were both at serious risk of an incursion of strangles. So we had a fairly um, comprehensive strangle screening programme at the time as good as it could get. Um, but we were very lucky that we had the Animal Health Trust nearby, so we also managed to refine our processes as they learned more about the science behind the disease. We practiced what they preached and actually then fed back to them the results, all, you know, all our samples went to them and so on. So although my job initially was to fix broken horses at Red Wings, I ended up getting much more interested in the um, the health prevention stuff that you can do when you have a big herd of horses. And you can see that you can reduce the number of horses you have to treat by 
actually doing the preventative stuff. And that's where worm control and screening and all that comes in. And then the welfare stuff for me ended up being something that followed organically after that. But often the welfare cases we would rescue would also then be at higher risk of infectious disease, either because their immune systems were shot to pieces or because they came from environments where neglect of health also meant neglect of welfare. And so strangles would be a frequent passenger on our new arrivals. Um, and I think for me, it's been uh, really interesting to see how our understanding of strangles has actually been one of the most advanced of the animal infectious diseases, um, like the genetics behind strangles. That, that work done at the AHT was actually not far behind the work done on humans. So it's, I think, the first non-human creature on the planet to have its full genome um, decoded, which led to the potential for PCR tests and the blood test and now the vaccine um, as a result of all of that. So, yeah, I think, you know, strangles ends up being something you get not only obsessed about, but quite uh, fascinated by when you work in this sort of environment where um, you have that uh, that need to protect your horses. And I think perhaps it's taken too long for people to recognise that actually livery yards are a herd and owners of livery yards have a duty to the whole herd and owners of individual horses, I think, sometimes lose sight of the fact that you know, they are part of a collective and infectious disease can jump from one horse to another, like flu, will not will not respond to the same screening and um, biosecurity practices as strangles because it's airborne. So, you, you, you know, when you're running a yard, you have a duty to a whole herd of horses and part of the responsibility of owners of horses is to, to work collectively with yard owners and give them that ability to protect everyone because you never know when your horse will be the victim, I think. Yeah, definitely. It's it's quite it's it's come on a lot, I think, all of the information about strangles, which has been really good to see. And I think the more information that's out there, the more people that are on board with trying to take steps to prevent it, because obviously there's a better understanding. Yeah. Um one thing I wanted to ask you, Nick, is is when when yard owners are thinking about implementing biosecurity policies and and you know that sort of thing, um it obviously will put some horse owners off because there's a biosecurity policy perhaps. And equally, you may have yards that don't have a biosecurity policy, but the horse owners wished that on that yard they did. Mm. Um, so the, it's always there will always be an element of an outbreak being a blame game about whose responsibility it is. So when it comes to sort of duty of care under the eyes of the, the welfare legislation and guidance, the the protection against infectious disease for horses that are on livery ultimately who's whose responsibility who should be overseeing that should it be the yard or should it be the horse owner so interestingly the animal welfare act hasn't been used that much um and not successfully in a big way to um uh, deal with infectious disease problems but i think where animals result, uh, end up suffering because of the emission by someone who had the power to act or the failure to act. Um, so I think when you get into a messy situation where the blame game really gets out of control, I think then people would start to look at, well, actually, did you do your your bit to protect my horse or vice versa? And I think that's why that relationship between liveries and clients is so important. And I think the, the right clients need to find the right liveries. Um, but actually, you know, to some extent also, I think there will be at some point like with the FEI, they've they've mandated which horses need to, you know, to compete. You have to be vaccinated against flu. It may well be that strangles comes under that at some point, and certain um, vaccine is you know like herpes will be added. Um, and if you want to compete, you have to do this. And I think um, yards that have a policy saying if you want to come on our yard, we would like you to have these vaccines. The same as with worm control and all of these things, that will become more of the norm. And it could even be that there will be regulation. You know, sanctuary regulation is being discussed in Wales and England and it happened in Scotland. So the regulation of establishments will will come. And I think whilst there might be kickback on uh, pushback on that, um, I think in the end, everyone is a winner because it gives more certainty to live yard owners of the framework. So everyone who signed up to the BHS will know that there's quite a, a detailed assessment process. And it's quite, you know, spend quite a bit of time and being inspected and um, on, on the plus side, once you have that, of course, people have more confidence that you're going to have 
you know, your, your fire extinguisher will probably work and your your yard is actually going to be safer. You're not going to have rusty, you know, doors held on by bits of baling twine. So I think the the the, the loss of freedom to do what you want is offset by I think um, you know structures that, like accreditation give you um, confidence that. And I think animal health is so so importantly part of that. And I think when we all accept that our horses are a herd, then biosecurity policies become a no brainer. Um, and it's not about anyone having to suffer because of it. Um, you know, I, I've got a new horse who I've been to a show, so why do I have to suffer? The, the reality is diseases don't discriminate. And right now, strangles and flu are quite easy. Um, but there are other diseases out there that are much worse. And if they come to our shores, then, you know, a, a failure to do biosecurity could end up causing far more distress to us and our horses. So when it comes to, yeah, coming back to this thing of responsibility, I think at the moment it's not, and absolutely clear that Jonathan or his client is responsible because the client disobeyed the, the guidance that's in his yard policy or that Jonathan didn't allow them to get their own vet to vaccinate their horse. I think that's it's not at that stage, but I think it sets a, a framework of what that relationship is, that both both parties have a responsibility to the horse. Ultimately, it's a horse that needs to be protected and th therefore that relationship between the two parties has to be focused on what's best for the horse and all the horses. Yeah, I totally agree. It's definitely a, a collaborative thing having horses at a livery yard. <laughs> um, so I know, like I like I mentioned at the beginning, obviously th through Strangles Awareness Week and all the other resources that are, that are offered by Red Wings throughout the year, the, the basics of Strangles are covered. But um, what do you feel are the most important aspects that yard owners should be aware of when it comes to trying to prevent outbreaks on the yard? So, for example, um, Strangles Awareness Week last week launched their best uh, campaign initiative. So maybe you could just give some information on that. On that. Yeah. So thank you. Because I mean, best basically was uh, to some extent we've we've summarised the various parts of the Strangles Awareness Week that we've had in previous years. So um, we have you know new things on the block. So we we've learned, for example, that in Strangles taking the horse's temperature, you will get a spike in fever, as Jonathan discovered, where if you isolate that horse, they, they're not yet snotting out the bug the same way we were with COVID before you've got symptoms. And fever is a symptom, but it's easier to take a temperature and know that you've got fever than wait for the horse to be off colour. So taking temperature is still absolutely critical. Um, isolation is so important because it's not just strangles you need to be worried about. And in future, we might have other diseases. So the principle of isolation also allows you to get to know the horse and the horse to know the environment. And I see that in the chat, there's a question around, um, you know, the horses being distressed about being alone. And I think yards can set things up so that you can have either a, an infrequent quarantine, but that it's in a place where the horse can feel included, but not contact, or you could have um, isolation that's um, done in a field. So, you know, you can do it in a way that's horse centred. And one of the resources we offer is to give people some tips on that. Um, and then, you know, the other thing about education, our, our themes there were centred around the fact that there's a new microchip available that if your horse isn't already chipped, new foals can get chipped with a, a thermo sensitive chip, which means taking temperature becomes as simple as running the scanner over their neck and it's cheap as chips, or you can buy one is a yard, which is more expensive, but it actually records and updates onto the horse's um, equine register um, or wherever you just you know, choose to put it. But actually, it makes it so easy to follow the the trends. And actually, when you have to enter competitions now, they might ask you for a printout of your horse's temperature. All new Weatherby's horses, for example, are being chipped with that. So technology allows us to get better because isolation is isolation is the enemy of horse fun and horse welfare. When you think about the horses want freedom and being with their friends and we're going to lock them away so biosecurity always needs to be done in a proportionate way and we need to get the most out of that so testing is on top of the time is so valuable so we're still talking about screening because if you screen you can get answers while you're waiting while those horses are going through their isolation period and Jonathan's point about the blood test I think is so important not every horse will get a positive result, whether it's a blood test, a PCR or a culture, but certainly the blood test is complicated because it needs the horse's immune system to react to an exposure to strangles. So if you're going to do blood, you need to really do two, and then you need to maybe scope after that anyway. So guttural pouch 
washing um, and I, I see someone was concerned about it Jonathan will answer whether clients find it off-putting but it really isn't invasive in the sense of being like an operation when vets get confident with doing it they do it so quick and so easy that you get results that are very reliable the t PCR test is so sensitive and it actually makes your decision making after that easy you can make the right decisions so I think in, and I think the one bit that's going to come out quite soon is Abby is going to present uh, hopefully at Beaver Congress this year that it seems to be that the way that the strains of strangles are being identified in the UK the dominant strain now was not the dominant strain in 2015. The, 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 the follow on from that is that if the chronic carriers, the horses with old chondroids in their head are the main source of infection, then the old strains would just still be going round and round and round. So whilst that, that old carrier on the yard or the old carrier who comes to a yard is a risk and when you scope them, you'll find that chondroid, you'll pop it out and actually the horse will be fine. It's horses that have recovered from strangles that then carry on doing their normal thing before they've been tested that are actually more likely to be sending the new strains of strangles out. So the new strain is becoming dominant simply because people are not screening after their infection. So I think for me, the big take home message from the campaign is being, you know, vets and owners stay educated because the new information can dramatically improve how good we can be at preventing the next outbreak. Yeah, so talking about you've mentioning the different strains, um, there's been a lot of discussion recently about the development of the strangles vaccine. Mm. Um, for example, Jonathan is requesting this from his new liveries um, and also it touches on a question that Nikki's asked in the chat as well. Um, what What is the current situation with the the success rate or the take up rate with vaccinating against strangles? And if you're a yard owner, where's the best place that you can find the most up to date and reliable information when it comes to strangles vaccines? So up to date information, the thing to do is to press your vets to go to the company that's distributing it. So we can't talk to um, clients. The, the company cannot promote uh, prescription only medicine to clients. Um, so it's down to the vets to talk about using it when they feel it's appropriate. So we need all vets to get familiar. So the new vaccine is quite a revolutionary um, product and it's the first of a new generation. The same as COVID vaccines were developed using genetic technology. It um, it was just brought through much more quickly, but the Strangvac vaccine was developed in, in very much the same principles. Previous vaccines involved, you know, you squish up the bug and you kind of chop one leg off and then you hope that it doesn't cause disease but it gives immunity or you boil it for five minutes and you you know see we were kind of maiming these things and trying to chop bits off and seeing if they give us an immunity and things like tetanus you can have a, almost lifelong immunity from just one one vaccine because it's quite an easy one to develop hiv strangles have turned out to be very elusive because they themselves actually are, are exploiting the immune system for what they want so actually developing an immune system to attack a bug that already knows more about your immune system than you do is quite challenging. So I think being aware of the new vaccine and its limitations and its potential is important because the one thing that they really were keen to develop was a vaccine that was safe. They also wanted to develop a vaccine that didn't trigger the blood test. So if you've got a horse that's vaccinated, you can still see whether or not on blood test that horse was, was exposed to strangles even while it had the vaccine which is sometimes very helpful when you get that sort of vaccination just before an outbreak type scenario. And it's like, well, is this a vaccine or is this my horse um, getting st full blown strangles or maybe mild strangles? So you can actually still tell the difference between those two. Um, and that it it has looked at stimulating the immune system differently to previous vaccines. So it's actually kind of going almost like it's working on the foundations rather than working on the roof and the windows, which is where previous vaccines thought that the the answers would be. And so what we have to see is obviously on a population level, what we know in the UK is that only 40% of horses are vaccinated against flu. If 60% of horses were vaccinated against flu, you wouldn't get outbreaks. Um, so on yards where not all horses are vaccinated against flu, but more than 70% of them are, when flu has got into those yards, and there's a, a recent example of that, the unvaccinated horses were protected, not because the owners um, kind of had some mystic spell, but because the other people had done what they should have done and vaccinated their horses and their actions protected the irresponsible horses owners from 
coming down with flu. And if anyone's seen horse flu in a horse that's not vaccinated, it's a horrible disease. You know, it can be truly devastating as well. So what we really want to see with this vaccine is a pe the more people will use it across the population, the likelihood is that it will actually protect the spread as well as the individual horse. At the moment, a lot of people are um, suddenly asking for the vaccine once the outbreaks already got to their top, their yard or their area, and that doesn't give it the best chance to work. But actually, when it's been used in that situation, it's turned out to be quite helpful to the um, the horses that are actually already almost too late. But in other countries, um, it was able to get licensed in Europe a bit sooner. And there they certainly seem to have been using it in, in, in all sorts, youngsters, older horses, um, stallions, mares. So they are putting the, the vaccine through its paces and it's demonstrating that it's safe. And really the effectiveness will be demonstrated by how many outbreaks are prevented. And that information is starting to come through. So the vets are actually working at collating their experiences with the vaccine and putting that into the, the published literature. So it's a bit of a long answer, but I think what's really important is it's it is a safe one. We have used it in horses here and the the data of how it works in the real world for something like a vaccine does take a bit of time to come through. But there is actually a real um, drive to put that in there. So the people to ask for your vet. On, on yard owners and horse owners being more accepting of biosecurity, I'm not sure. Um, but either way, if it's just naturally developed, then it's it's great either way. Um, when it comes to the conclusion of a strangles outbreak, this also touches on another question that's been asked in the chat. Um, is there any precautions that yard owners should take before they're reopening their yard in terms of horse movements? I know that Jonathan said that he was he had horses that left before the yard as a whole tested clear. Would would that be normal or is that considered being risky to the to the owners that choose to move their horses to another yard? And then would that Sorry, this is a long question. <laughs> Would that subsequently then pose a risk to the next yard that that horse goes to? Um, you know, what yeah. what should a what should a yard, owner, a yard owner consider basically about sort of lifting up the lockdown and the cautions to take? So, with us, what, what, the mistake that happened at Red Wings in ninety one was that we didn't do all in, all out. I think every you know until everybody's clear, nobody's clear. The 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 challenge is you can't always force people to do that. And the thing is as well, if you are confident that your your grouping, so your green group, your amber group, your red group are successful, then there's really no reason for a green group horse not to, to leave if everybody's doing what they've been asked to do, which, you know, to follow the steps. And I think Jonathan made a really interesting comment earlier about the fact that, you know, um, mistakes do happen and actually if you look at the kind of advice we've got i've realized over the years we always have things go wrong with our quarantine but because more than one thing's protecting us we get away with it so overalls disinfectant distance separating testing each of those provides another layer so i think when it comes to people's decision to leave if their horse has been scoped clear and it's been kept separate from others then it's probably not a risk to other people but if you are looking at horses that have been previously infected so if someone, for example, refused to have their horse tested during the outbreak, the horse had no symptoms and then they left without testing their horse. For all you know, that horse is a carry itself or actually that horse was incubating it because there was some cross contamination. Because I think the mindset of working collaboratively with the yard owner like Jonathan and saying we will get our horses tested also goes to the, the kind of mentality of the person who then also wouldn't do sneaky things. Um, and, you know, sadly, I'm absolutely aware of people who make up the temperature things that they are expected to write down before they go to competitions. You know, and you know, if people are going to do that, at, at some point, the, the, the authorities are going to lose patience and say, well, you need the thermal microchip or you can't compete. Because if people are going to cheat, of course, it just brings the whole house of cards down. Um, and, you know, the Valencia wasn't just tragic for the huge impact on, on the events and the circuit. But, you know, lots of people lost horses, really valuable horses that could have maybe been the next Olympic champion, but it's now dead. So what's, you know, that's not going to happen. And certainly, I mean, in Sweden, they looked at the cost of um, vaccinating every horse against strangles in Sweden was cheaper than what it cost to shut down a racetrack when they had an outbreak next to the racetrack. And that was only last year. They're going to hopefully publish that. So, you know, the, the the impact of not doing the right thing is just so much worse. So I think 
at the end of an outbreak, testing all the horses is the way to go, particularly if you've got a lot of people trying to work together on a yard where there's no clear management or ownership, because quite often there you find that the outbreak continues bubbling under because somebody's not been following the steps because they thought they were in the clear because their horse was on the green field yesterday. You know, really, and that that absolute authoritarian kind of control, that dictatorship, it's it's necessary. And actually, the yards that have been very successful in containing outbreaks have also managed to get the vets to work in the same way. So one practice becomes the lead practice on that, and the other vets don't actually undermine the big problem with vets giving contradictory advice is usually because they get questions that only give them half the information. So they're answering a different question to the one that you think they should be answering. So they themselves are sometimes held back from being supportive. So getting one practice to work with one livery yard manager is, is absolutely um, a key to a quick end to an outbreak. Brilliant. Just to, just to ch uh, chime in on this thing about horses moving off the yard. but. Because we're treated each herd in isolation and every herd was confirmed as being clear by virtue of the fact that a lot of time had passed and then they had had, and they had, had temperature checks every day and they had then had a negative guttural pouch wash, we knew that all the horses in that herd that were all tested on the same day were clear. Yeah. There was, you know, this is a 200 acre site it's really easy to separate a herd of either amber or red horses off to the opposite side of the farm. The the staff and the liveries, well, sorry, the liveries manage their own horses and the staff use PPE to manage those horses if they go up there at all. Um, so we were we were all pretty confident that horses leaving the green fields were clear. Um, it it wasn't like we were just throwing people out the door um the the vets were happy with it i think we even spoke to you nick as well didn't we mm -hmm. um, yes i think because there were some there's always questions i think you know that's the thing is to just keep asking questions because each each situation often has its own unique thing so that the right answer might be very different for the one horse leaving the yard than the next yeah. one and i think that's where the vet support can be so helpful to to help people make them you know so you don't want to waste people's money testing unnecessarily but equally you don't want to give a yeah it's it probably will be okay but if you're not testing then we don't know yeah that's been really useful thanks for all that info nick you're like a font of knowledge about all things strangles as always um i think we've done a quite a good job of answering the questions actually which have popped up in the chat but there was one that i was going to just direct to andrew because i think where you have a, a Jonathan, I don't know why I called you Andrew. Um, <laughs> I'm going to direct it to Jonathan even because um, obviously you have quite a, quite an invested biosecurity policy in place, and I think perhaps one fear that a lot of yard owners have when they think about introducing this sort of thing is that it will perhaps put off mm. um, potential livery clients. You know, if somebody approaches you for livery and you say. Well, before we take your horse on the yard, we have to do X, Y, and Z to make sure they're not bringing anything in. I mean, sure. obviously, by the sounds of things, most of the time you are a full livery yard. Um, and so, do you do you find even before you had an outbreak or with the new rules that you've ever had any problems with potential liveries being put off because of your policies or or any any particular comments that have been made against it? Whenever we show people around and we talk them through it, they are really happy that we have these policies in place. And in fact, I would say that we end up with a better quality of client uh, because they are willing to go through this. They see the value in it. And when they have arrived and they've had a guttural pouch wash, they're actually invested in being here. So I think we'll see fewer yard hoppers going forward because we we have had them in the past. I think we will I think this will make the customers that we have better quality and stickier. Um, so will it put people off? Maybe. Am I bothered? Not really, because I'm going to get the people that I want. Yeah, I, sp I suppose if it's putting people off, they're not they're not your your kind of people. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I think I think we have covered everything. I think I've 
touched on most of the questions. I know there's a couple of questions about sort of general isolation and that uh, Polly has just asked about Jonathan's rules on travelling. Um, but uh, I know that there's an email going out tomorrow that SEIB is sending out, which has got a lot of resources on. So if nobody has any other questions, um, obviously the email tomorrow will point you in the direction of um, the Red Wing Strangles Hub. And there's obviously resources uh, in terms of biosecurity and yard management on the Yard Owner Hub. Um, and Katie will include all of that tomorrow. So I shall thank you very much for attending and listening to us all jabber on about strangles for over an hour. Um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and to our speakers. Before we go, I just wanted to cover off very quickly, because I know we have overrun the insurance side of things. I also feel obliged to say that we weren't the insurance providers um, for Jonathan when he had the outbreak. Um, so quick disclaimer, obviously everything I'm about to say is in relation only to SEIB's policies. So our infectious diseases cover is only available when you include property and business interruption cover on your yard insurance. When you include this, it then becomes an automatic extension to the business interruption cover. So there's no additional cost for it. It just automatically kicks in. As with everything, please do always check your policy wordings when taking out business interruption cover, because as Jonathan mentioned earlier, you can come unstuck and it isn't always top of mind when you're buying your insurance. When you have business interruption cover, there are likely to be a few restrictions on the policy. For example, there might be a limit per any one claim and certain biosecurity and veterinary procedures that the yard would need to have in place in order for a claim to be considered. So, yeah, again, just to echo it, please do always check the terms of your cover. And if you do have any questions, just ask your broker. You know, it's definitely worthwhile giving them a call and double check in before anything happens because you don't want it to happen and then find out that you don't have the cover in place. Um, following the webinar, as Cheryl's already mentioned, I am going to be sending out the recording. That will come tomorrow. Then in a couple of days time, you'll receive a larger email that's got tons of resources on there. One of those resources is going to be a link for you to request a quote or just a free review of your insurance. There's no obligation to this. You know, SIB just want to help yard owners out. And if it's a case that we review your insurance, and you don't have the cover that you need. At least, you know. Um, so, yeah, please do have a look at that email. Um, and, yeah, that's it from me. So, yeah, thank you again to our speakers and to all of you for joining. Hope you've enjoyed it and found it um, an insightful evening.